What's cracking, y'all? Welcome back to the station. Welcome back to the channel. Y'all know who it is. It's your boy, Ray G. You can find me on Twitter, at Ray GQ. And if you've come to this channel looking for rookie content, damn it, you're in the right place because that's what the Rookie Report is all about. I'll be following with these rookies all the way from week one through week 18. We looked at them every single week during the preseason, but now that the NFL season is here and we got some actionable information to sort of digest, consume, apply, this is where these shows are going to get fun. Really, uh, really want to dive into these players. So let me know in the comments how you feeling about some of the rookies that I discuss and maybe some that I don't get a chance to touch on today. But we're going to talk about how they should be valued right now in seasonal leagues as well as in dynasty leagues. So if you're new and you stick around to the end of the show, you find the information on actionable and or entertaining hit the subscribe button hit the thumbs up button leave a comment below but let's get right into it and let's start out with the rookie that everybody's talking about i'm seeing i just saw uh, scott connor inside of our discord patreon.com forward slash all gas just posted a trade where this player was traded straight up for drake london i'm talking about the los angeles rams all pro wide receiver puka nakua the young rookie went out there Week one, rocking the number 17 and was very uh, reminiscent of an old Ram that wore number 17, one Robert Woods. Cooper Cup out on IR. He's going to miss the first, what, three or four games with the hamstring injury. And Puka Nakua literally stepped into the Cooper Cup role. He was phenomenal. I don't need to list off everything we know. 10 plus receptions, 15 targets, crazy amount of targets per route run. You look at the yards per route run, the air yard share. I mean, Puka Nakua was literally Cooper Cup on the field for the Rams. A lot of people are asking me right now, Ray, do you think he can continue? What would you trade him for? What would you do with him? Well, I roster him in a lot of dynasty leagues, and I could not and would not fault anybody for capitalizing and cashing out on Puka Nakua today. However, I do believe that absent week two versus the 49ers, that he's going to continue to be utilized in this role, which is a high-value role, with Matthew Stafford. And he's clearly healthy. He wants to sling the ball around. We know he's on QB Netflix quarterback show this year. Stafford looked damn good. So if Nakua is going to be out there, Cooper Cup's going to continue to miss time. I'm willing to ride this a little bit more. I'm a little more risk-tolerant, so I'll hold on another week or two, let that stock continue to climb. I think there's a real possibility you can get a 25 first for him very soon literally saw him traded straight up for drake london whose situation ain't good either and i'll talk about him in another video the wide receiver trinity video make sure you stay tuned week two of that but puka nakua right now um one of the hottest names in the market and i do think that as long as cooper cup is out he will continue to assume this role good for you if you were able to draft him in the third or fourth round of rookie drafts i'm not really in the market to buy him today i would not unload the clip for him uh, on fab and waivers so uh, waivers have already run for most of you now he should not be on waivers anywhere in any league do i think this will continue i do as long as cooper cup is out i think the is going to be good and it's a hamstring injury if cup comes back reaggravates it he's right back into that role so good value bump on puka would not fault anybody for cashing out today I'm just a little more risk tolerant, so I'm going to wait a couple of more games until that goes up. It ain't going to happen week two versus the 49ers, but I'll go week three, week four. So next rookie, another guy who uh, made his debut uh, in a big way. Splash, big play, Jordan Addison down the field, boom, early too for the Minnesota Vikings. Really showed when you have all three of these guys, Jordan Addison, Justin Jefferson, and TJ Hawkinson on the field, how difficult it will be for defenders to guard them. Now, the running game wasn't that good, but Jordan Addison did well. Now, we're looking at the – and what we're using is the utilization report on Matthew Barry's Fantasy Life. Shout out to them. Partnered with them for this season. Dwayne McFarland put a lot of time in this tool. Highly suggest everybody check it out. So, looking at Jordan Addison, while I am excited about his long-term potential, you look at this, right? He's still – was third in routes between the wide receivers. K.J. Osborne ran 94% of the routes to, Ju to Jordan Addison, 66%, and Justin Jefferson's 100%. Targets per route run, pretty good for Jordan Addison, right? 19%, so he's being targeted more than K.J. Osborne, but he's just not on the field. He did have a nice amount of air yard share, 28%. Osborne right behind him. So I'm encouraged and excited for Jordan Addison. Do I think that in he is a must-start Every single week type wide receiver right now, I do not believe that he is that yet, but I do think as the things continue and the season moves on, 
He might trend in that direction. It was exciting. It was encouraging. But I'm not quite there yet with Jordan Addison as a must-start receiver today. Flex in a pinch, absolutely. Best ball, 100%. Got to plug him in your lineup. I'd, I'd tread a little carefully with Addison right now. Player I would not tread carefully about. And it seems like ev everything that I'm seeing right now are people trying to find ways to uh, discredit the performance or lower your expectations. And damn it, I'm here to raise them back up because I'm excited for Baltimore Ravens star wide receiver Zay Flowers. In the previous rookie report video, I put him at wide receiver two right behind JSN. Pick JSN, then, then J Zay Flowers. And it was for a lot of the reasons that I discussed in that video that you look at the Baltimore Ravens and there's no doubt it doesn't take a trained, skilled expert to watch that game and realize he's got more juice than anybody else out there. He looked like the most explosive receiver on the field, the best receiver Baltimore can utilize, and they did just that. When you look at his utilization from week one, uh, that's Jordan Addison, my bad. You put up Zay Flowers. Here we go. Zay Flowers, 93% uh, of the routes, Zay Flowers, 36% uh, targets per route run. He had an air yard share of 25%, which was second on the team next to Odell Beckham Jr., 5.89 yards after contact per reception. And, I mean, good Lord, 50% target. I mean, they're just throwing him the ball every time. The target share, over 40%. That's elite territory for a young rookie. Now, I get his average depth of target was low, had to do a lot of damage after the catch, but when you look at his route chart and the targets and Lamar Jackson and where he was going with the ball, it was a priority to get this young man involved early. A lot of people are like, well, Mark Ingram is out. Mark Andrews was out. That's the only reason why. Well, in 2021, when Mark Andrews and Hollywood Brown were there, both of those guys thrive. Hollywood at his best season. Andrews, I believe, at 1,300 yards with Lamar Jackson. What he did this game was hyper-target his guy, Zay Flowers. And when Mark Andrews comes back, that means less attention to Zay Flowers. You still have to respect Odo Beckham Jr., who did garner 40% of the air yard share. Rashad Bateman looks like the odd man out here with only 15% uh, target share in this matchup. But Zay Flowers, is um, he looked good. I'm not comping him to anybody. But he did have some, like, young... He looked a little like young A.B. out there. He looked like young A.B. He is not A.B., not there yet. That's a Hall of Fame receiver. Zay Flowers looked good. In Dynasty, I want him over a lot of players. Have not updated my rankings Wait till week three to do that. He's going to be jumping up in the dynasty ranks. I'm very bullish on Zay Flowers, and uh, I'm not going to let anybody try to dim that light. So don't worry about that, y'all. Zay Flowers played well, looked good, and I think Baltimore is going to continue to prioritize this young man. All right, Jonathan Mingo, rookie wide receiver for the Carolina Panthers. Listen, there are a lot of things that you watch Mingo's game, and he's not, he's not the most polished receiver yet. He doesn't have a full route tree, all that other stuff. He's big, he's fast, he's physical. And in week one, despite uh, the Carolina Panthers' struggles, there were some bright spots, and I believe Jonathan Mingo was one of those bright spots. You look at the three wide receivers that were on the field, Terrace Marshall, Mingo, and Adam Thielen. Target share for Jonathan Mingo, 17%, which was second on the team behind Terrace Marshall. So old man Thielen, we talked about him in the first Trinity video, didn't get a lot of love. In week one, a lot of that love went to Terrace Marshall and Jonathan Mingo. But what you like to see is the air yard share. Bryce Young, when he did take shots deep, it was to Jonathan Mingo and Terrace Marshall. Mingo's getting down the field. He's garnering some of those targets early. He's going to have to do a lot of damage after the catch. These guys didn't score anything in any format. Comma, however, I'm paying attention to the usage. How are these guys being used? And at some point, the Carolina Panthers are going to just have to let Bryce Young grow. They're going to have to let him throw it. I know they want to protect him. They've got an offensive guard that's out now. Things are not looking good in Carolina. Let the young man throw. One of the things that I appreciated about Houston, let Stroud throw the ball. Ripped it 44 times, I believe. Not all good, but not all bad either. Let Bryce Young throw it. Jonathan Mingo. Dynasty, feeling really good about him. I'm, I'm very encouraged in Dynasty about Jonathan Mingo in seasonal leagues. No interest. You're not starting them right now. But in Dynasty, I feel pretty damn good about Mingo. Let's go to the position that a lot of people had questions marks about going into the NFL draft because there were so many tight ends selected early. Who was going to be the guy that you wanted out of this class? And week one was any indication. Luke Musgrave looks like definitely one of the premier tight ends from the 2023 class and a type of tight end that could be an absolute monster for fantasy purposes. He could have scored 
Long touchdown. Jordan Love threw across field. He fell down, couldn't get up. But you look at this compared to the other tight ends, Tucker Craft, Isaiah DeGuar, and some guy named Ben Sims. No Christian Watson, apparently a hobbled Romeo Dobbs, and a, a, I don't want to say a rookie quarterback, but a first-year starter in Jordan Love. Luke Musgrave, 80% of the routes. No other tight end had more than 14%. He was targeted on uh, 15% of Jordan Love's throws. No other tight end, nothing. Just nothing, nothing, nothing. 8 out of 18, there was a long pass. Air yards over a long pass. Point is, he is the guy. It's not Tucker Craft. It's not Isaiah DeGuara. It's not some other random person that we might have thought of tried to play wide. It's Luke Musgrave. He's big. He's athletic. He's fast. And more importantly, Jordan Love looked like I told you he would. Probably above, above what people think he may be. I'm not saying he's going to be some superstar but I do think Jordan Love is going to finish the season. He's going to look back and be like, damn, he was a little bit better than I thought he would be. And if Jordan Love is going to be competent, and you're talking about a wide receiver core who it's a young Jaden Reed, it's a young Romeo Dobbs in his second year, and a young Christian Watson, they're all young guys. Jordan Love is doing it with rookies and second-year receivers. Luke Musgrave right now is definitely looking like one of the tight ends to own from this 2023 class. I feel very good about him in Dynasty, especially in tight end premium leagues. Seasonal leagues, not yet. I'm not there with starting Luke Musgrave as a guy that you want to stream in a pinch. If you got to do it, go ahead. But not not quite there yet in seasonal leagues. And let's talk about the only other tight end that you really want uh, from the class outside of uh, Musgrave. We talked about Laporta on the last video. Uh, Sam Laporta was good. I, I want me some Sam Laporta. But Dalton Kincaid, I believe, stepped up to the plate. He stepped up to the plate in week one, and the Buffalo Bills were bad. Josh Allen was awful. We all watched the game. But we got to see him on the field in conjunction with Dawson Knox. And Dalton Kincaid still did his thing. They both ran about 78% of the routes. Dawson Knox, 78%. Dalton Kincaid, 76%. 11% uh, targets per route run for Kincaid. Almost identical for Knox. Identical target share, 10% for each of these guys. No air yards for Dalton Kincaid. They kept, kept it close for the young rookie. Uh, but you just look at what they scored PPR-wise, 5.5 for Knox and 6.6 for Dalton Kincaid. What was encouraging is the fact that he was on the field early with Dawson Knox. Absent Dawson Knox really wasn't on the field, I believe, in 11 personnel when it was just one tight end lined up. But the usage for Dalton Kincaid early this season, early in week one this season, was encouraging. Again, just like Musgrave, not a player that I want to start in seasonal leagues. Like, if you have to, you're betting on the offense, you're betting on Josh Allen. If I had better options, I would definitely play them over Kincaid right now. But very, very encouraging, bullish by his usage week one. Stock up for Dalton Kincaid. Let's go to a running back. And uh, I get this game was not a blowout, but it was out of reach. The game was over. They're still running plays, getting reps in. But you watch this guy run the ball compared to the other two players run the ball, and you're like, man, I hope they give this guy the ball a little bit more. And the guy that I'm talking about is Roshan Johnson from the Chicago Bears. The little used, seldom used running back out of Texas because he had to share a backfield with B. John Robinson, got some NFL action as the third running back in the rotation behind Khalil Herbert and uh, Deontay Foreman. And when Roshan Johnson got the ball, Roshan Johnson made people feel it. He was catching passes. He is running over folks in the middle of the field, and he looked good. 37% of the snaps went to Roshan, more than Khalil Herbert, more than Deontay Foreman, but at that point, they had those guys out of the game, starters were out of the game. Uh, what was encouraging about Roshan was his route participation, being utilized in the receiving game, and that was one of the things that people liked about him coming out of Texas. He was like a dual-threat running back. He can run between the tackles, and he can stay on the field because he is a good pass protector, and he can catch the ball. We know Khalil Herbert is not the best at doing that. He is not the best third down, got to protect Justin Fields. They didn't even have a lot of running backs back there doing that, but that's not his forte. But despite that, I mean, 41% targets per out run. So when he was running it, dump offs were going to uh, going to Roshan Johnson, and he was physical. He's the only running back that had an attempt inside the five-yard line. He looked good. You watch the game, and he just looked good. You know, I want to see this guy play. So... Seasonal leagues, are you starting him? No, absolutely not. He's still the third running back behind Foreman and behind Herbert. But if you have him in Dynasty or an opportunity to go ahead and slide him into a deal, 
Roshan would be one that I'd be willing to bet on if things get a little out of hand for Chicago. You know, they want to see what they got for the future, that he's just the guy towards the end of the season when you really need him for the fantasy playoffs. So very encouraged by the usage of Roshan Johnson and the play of Roshan Johnson in week one. This one just, I, I didn't know what was going on. I, I was like, is Derrick Henry hurt? Is Derrick, where is Derrick Henry? Because I did not see anybody on the field besides Tajay Spears during the Saints game. I'm wondering where the hell Henry was. And then they put him in, he rips off like 20 yard runs and you're like, give him the ball more. We need the Henry touchdown, but no, Tajay Spears, rookie out of Tulane, got on the field and played a lot. 56% of the snaps, Tajay Spears, 47% to Derrick Henry. Now, when Derrick Henry was on the field, 79% of the rush attempts went to him, whereas only 16% went to Tajay Spears. But what they tried to do, and it was a concerted effort, you saw it all game, was utilize him in the wheel game, down the field, and in the passing game. 50% of the routes went to Spears, 20% targets per route run. He had a 13% target share, and he was just on the field a lot. You saw Spears on the field more than maybe a lot of people anticipated. Is Tennessee preparing for life without Derrick Henry, or do they just realize this young man is explosive? He looked good, should have caught a touchdown pass. It was going to be a hard hit regardless. He dropped the ball. But Spears being on the field early for the Titans and the Titans actually being in this game is encouraging about maybe where his future usage could head. So Tajay Spears, again, not a seasonal guy. You're not going to start him in any league right now. In Dynasty, you're glad you have him. In Dynasty, you're like, all right, I'm glad I've got some Tajay Spears. Right now, how you feeling about uh, Quinn Johnston? QJ, Los Angeles Chargers, did not play a lot. Did not play a lot in week one. Played well behind Mike Williams. Played well behind Keenan Allen. And also Josh Palmer, who was on the field 74% of the routes. Mike Williams a little banged up. QJ, only 30% route, 38% route participation. When he did run his routes, 19% target share, which is much higher than Josh Palmer, who is literally getting wind sprints. 74% route participation, 3% targets per route run. He is literally just getting wind sprints, and at least QJ is getting a couple of targets. He earned a 10% target share, which was third on his team uh, after week one behind Mike Williams and Keenan Allen uh, at 30%. And then the average depth of target for QJ, you know he goes down the field, 12, uh, 12 A dot, which was higher than Mike Williams, 16% air yard share. A lot of people drafted QJ thinking that maybe he could be a flex guy out the gate. I would not do that. Seems like the Chargers want to run the ball. It's Kellen Moore. It's a different offense. Kellen Moore loved to establish it with Zeke and Tony Pollard. They had 200-yard rushers damn near with Josh Kelly with 91 and Eckler went over 115. I know Eckler's a little banged up. He said he's going to play. I believe they've promoted Spiller, so I'm not sure about that. Point is, it may not be as volume heavy on the, on the passing side early. That was a shootout they were in with the Miami Dolphins, and QJ still wasn't out there, you know, catching a lot of passes or running a lot of routes for that matter. So looks like this team dynamic is changing just a little bit. So tread carefully with Quentin Johnston. Dynasty, not full-fledged panic, not at all. Season leagues, no way you can start him. You cannot start Quentin Johnston right now. Do not do it unless it's a deep league and, and, and you have no other choice. But I would try hard not to do that right now. Let him mature a little bit more. Let this offense evolve under Kellen Moore. Right now, you cannot start Quentin Johnston. Who else we got? Uh, another player who we were all bullish on and excited and hyping up and talking about and thought can go out there and take this job week one. Did absolutely nothing. Zach Charbonnet of the Seattle Seahawks, and they got put foot put in him by the Rams. So the Seahawks went out there. Uh, two tackles got hurt. I believe Abe Lucas, Abe Lucas came back. Charles Cross, not sure the extent of his injury, but I know he was hurt in that game. Zach Charbonnet and Kenneth Walker, that was all the talk. Sharbs and Walker, Sharbs and Walker. And it was uh, Kenneth Walker, 65% of the snaps, 60%, 40 percenters. We talked about that on DD Radio. The other two running backs, DJ Dallas and Zach Charbonnet combined for that 40%. 20 for DJ Dallas and 24% for Zach Charbonnet. Now, when Charbonnet went out there, he got the same type of rushing share that DJ Dallas did. And he ran more routes than DJ Dallas, 24% for Zach Charbonnet, but Kenneth Walker, 55% route share, 18% target share for Kenneth Walker, and zero for Zach Charbonnet. So Kenneth Walker's not only out-snapping Sharbs over double, he's running more routes over double, he's getting thrown the ball more, he's getting to rush it. This is Kenneth Walker's backfield. Until he gets hurt, 
until something happens, until he doesn't perform, Kenneth Walker, this is his backfield, right? We were wrong, was not going to be an even split early. Now, Pete Carroll is known for some shenanigans, so things can change. But right now, this is looking like K-9's backfield. Zach Charbonnet, a nice depth piece. Do not play him. Don't start him. Don't jam him in a lineup and hope and pray he gets in the end zone. Can't do it. You don't want to pull the tank Bigsby. Yes, he scored, but outside of that, nothing happened. This is Kenneth Walker's backfield, and if something were to happen to Walker, it's probably going to be a healthy dose of DJ Dallas in combination with Zach Charbonnet, at least based on usage rate and uh, patterns in week one. All right, the last guy we're going to talk about, you know we're not going to get out of here without having some quarterback talk. I thought Bryce Young looked like a rookie. Struggled. Looked like a rookie. Struggled. Looked like a rookie, but did make some throws in that game where I'm like, all right, let's see this offense open it up a little bit and give Bryce Young an opportunity. But in my opinion, he was the worst of the three quarterbacks. I thought C.J. Stroud versus Baltimore's O-line did him no favors. And he stood in there and he made some good throws. He made Nico Collins very relevant. Had Robert Woods looking like he can still play. Threw the ball 40 times. Very encouraged by C.J. Stroud. V feels very Jared Goffish with Stroud. They can protect him, get some more weapons around him. They've already said they're going to utilize Tank Dell a little bit more with Noah Brown out. C.J. Stroud, very encouraged by him as well as the man of the hour, Anthony Richardson, who went out there and um, played very well. I thought he did a lot of good things on Sunday. Shane Steichen made the game comfortable for him. A lot of his passes, we saw his passing chart. A lot of his passes were going to the right of the field, and you know that's exactly what Shane Steichen did with Jalen Hurts prior to getting A.J. Brown. I think a lot of people went out there and they thought that they see Anthony, Rich Anthony Richardson really struggle Looked like the game was too big, and he was anything but that. He was very comfortable in the pocket. I thought he delivered a lot of good throws. He helped Michael Pittman on his way to a good day. Uh, you know, you, you look at this right here, 65% completion percentage. Uh, he scrambled around, ran the ball well, finished that week as a top 10 quarterback, as a rookie, I believe top five, with 21.92 points. Everything you saw from A. Rich is what, like, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get the rushing upside. You're going to get consolidated targets. Alec Pierce was not involved. He didn't even look to the left side of the field. It was Kylan Granson. It was Michael Pittman Jr. It was Anthony Richardson run the ball. You're going to get some wild plays, and you're also going to get some ams. Even the interception, you watch that game, that's not even, that, that, that isn't even the play that you're like, ah, he tried to make a whole shot. Tyson Campbell's one of the best corner, young corners in the game, made a great play on that ball. Richardson needed to feather that thing a little bit more over the top. It was the sacks. Josh Allen had like three sacks on him in the first half of football. So it's cleaning up some of that stuff. But what we're looking for, for fantasy, you're walking away after week one thinking, I got something here with A. Rich. The Colts were more competitive than we thought. They have absolutely no running game. So you just only imagine what that thing would look like with Jonathan Taylor. But everybody should be pretty encouraged by Anthony Richardson. I thought he put a lot of good things on tape was the best-looking rookie quarterback coming out of week one. A lot of season left, a lot of season left, but I'm excited to continue to follow these players all the way to the end of the season with you. So I appreciate you being here for the first rendition of the week one 2023 rookie report. If you stuck around to the end of the video, and like I said, if you found it actionable and or entertaining, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, comment below. Let me know which rookies you want me to talk about. I know I didn't hit on Marvin Mims and a couple of other guys, but we got all season for that. So thank you for watching the video and I'll see y'all soon. I'm out, peace.